Excited Utterance, The Evidence and Proof Podcast, Episode Number 24, Eyal Zamir, New Evidence About Circumstantial Evidence. Welcome to Excited Utterance. I'm your host, Ed Chang, from Vanderbilt Law School. Excited Utterance is your podcast for cutting-edge scholarship and developments in the world of evidence. Our goal is to bring a virtual workshop to you every week throughout the academic year. This week, our guest is Eyal Zamir. Eyal is the Augusto Levy Professor of Commercial Law at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, where he served as Dean of the Law Faculty from 2002 to 2005. His fields of interest include commercial law, economic and behavioral analysis of law, legal ethics, and empirical legal studies. Our podcast today focuses on Eyal's new article, New Evidence About Circumstantial Evidence, which is co-authored with Alicia Harlev and Ilana Ritoff. The article is a follow-up to an earlier article that Eyal published with Ilana Ritoff and Duran Teichman in 2014 in the Indiana Law Journal entitled Seeing is Believing, the Anti-Inference Bias. Since both articles are best understood together, We'll explore both of them in this podcast. In this series of articles, Eyal tries to get to the bottom of the legal system's preference against circumstantial evidence. A number of scholars, including Wigmore, have criticized the distinction between direct and circumstantial evidence, arguing that all evidence involves inferences, whether commonly thought of as circumstantial or not. The question thus becomes, What explains the preference's uncanny persistence? Why are we simply less willing to convict on the basis of circumstantial evidence? Is the preference legitimate? And if not, what can the legal system do to get rid of it? Eyal, welcome to Excited Utterance. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you. So, circumstantial evidence. The legal system, whether officially or in practice, often favors direct evidence over circumstantial evidence. On an epistemic and policy level, is this a legitimate distinction to make? First, I think we should say a few words on the very distinction. As commonly perceived, direct evidence proves a material fact without the mediation of a deductive process. Circumstantial evidence requires an additional step of inference from the fact proven by the evidence to the material fact. When a witness saw the defendant stabbing the victim, it is direct evidence. When she saw the defendant fleeing from the scene of the crime with a knife in his hand, this is circumstantial. Now, there's a broad consensus among evidence scholars and legal policymakers that there is no good reason to treat direct and circumstantial evidence differently. In fact, the very distinction between the two is challenged on the ground that any evidence requires some inference. From the fact that the witness testifies that she saw the defendant stabbing the victim and the fact finder's belief that the witness tells the truth, the fact finder infers that the defendant actually committed the crime. Anyhow, lay persons and juries do conventionally draw this distinction. So we often hear defense lawyers saying that all the prosecution has is a bunch of circumstantial evidence, by which they mean that the prosecution does not have real evidence. The assumption that circumstantial evidence is less reliable than direct one is especially troubling when one recalls that many studies point to various problems with eyewitness testimonies. These studies imply that some circumstantial evidence are actually more reliable than some direct evidence. Why then does the legal system have this preference for direct evidence? In a 2014 article that you wrote with Ilana Rithoff and Duran Teichman, you discuss a variety of theories. Could you give us a quick summary of some of the major proposals? The previous literature indeed offered various justifications, or at least explanations, for the reluctance to impose legal liability based on circumstantial evidence alone. Much of the discussion has revolved around naked statistical evidence, which is one type of circumstantial evidence, but some explanations refer to circumstantial evidence more generally. I'll mention some of them. So one argument is that circumstantial evidence is by nature less conclusive because different inferences can be drawn from the same circumstantial evidence. Hence, it is less safe to impose liability on the basis of such evidence. But alternatively, even if circumstantial evidence is objectively as conclusive as direct evidence, 
it has been argued that fact finders may subjectively perceive circumstantial evidence as less conclusive. Another explanation hinges on the psychological process of judicial fact finding, which is one of constructing a coherent story from the available evidence. So it has been argued that eyewitness testimonies are more vivid and concrete than circumstantial evidence. Hence, it is easier to form a coherent story of the events from direct evidence. Yet another theory, which refers primarily to naked statistical evidence, has to do with the case specificity of the evidence. The probability that a certain fact is true may be high, and yet the weight or the resiliency of the evidence supporting the claim is low. So conclusions should not be based on probability estimates that rest on too little information or on non-case-specific evidence. A fifth explanation, though hardly a justification, has to do with responsibility taking. With testimonies, the witness is to blame for an erroneous verdict. In contrast, erroneous inference from circumstantial evidence is the fact finder's responsibility. To avoid the feeling of regret, fact finders might be disinclined to rely on such evidence. Finally, psychologists have highlighted the issue of ease of simulation. It is argued that the willingness to ground liability on any evidence depends on how easily one can imagine an alternative scenario that would be compatible with the evidence. Since circumstantial evidence does not prove the material fact itself, it is easier to imagine such a scenario when the only evidence is circumstantial. So we have this bunch of theories that have been proposed. I think many of them are plausible. What were your goals going into this project? What did you hope to better understand? Well, my interest in this issue was not theory-driven, but actually came from my experience. So a few years ago, I regularly used the toll road in Israel, where cameras document each car at any interchange, and they do it in order to send you the bill. So uh, those cameras document the exact time at which each car passes an accident. Now, a great many drivers exceed the speed limit on the highway, and it should be very easy to convict all of them. From the distance between each two cameras and the time that elapses between their documentation of each car, it is possible to calculate the average speed of the car at any section of the road. And yet, this is not done. Of course, there may be various explanations for this non-enforcement, but I wondered whether part of the explanation might have to do with a reluctance to impose liability when nobody, including no camera, has actually saw the car exceeding the speed limit. So we run an experiment in which half of the subject read a description referring to a speed camera system, and the other half read a description of a two-camera system in which the cameras do not document the speed, but only the exact time at which each car passes next to each camera, and from the distance and time difference, the speed of the car is inferred. Both conditions, the objective reliability of the system was described identically, as was the required burden of proof, which is beyond a reasonable doubt. And yet, while more than 80% of the subject in the speed camera condition convicted a driver who exceeded the speed limit, only 60% were willing to convict in the two camera system. All of these results from your psychological experiments in this 2014 article are really quite fascinating. And I somewhat regret that we don't have time to talk about all of the experiments. But could you share perhaps another experiment that was done in that article that you found illuminating in addition to this highway one? Yes, I'll describe one more experiment, and this time based on my background as a farm boy. So imagine yourself as a judge in a suit filed by a small dairy against a farmer. The dairy buys milk from the farmer. According to the contract, the farmer should make sure that there are no antibiotics residues in the milk. Every day in which the milk delivered by the farmer contains antibiotics, according to the contract, the, he must pay the, the dairy an agreed sum of money. The milk is delivered to the dairy by a tanker that transports the milk of two farmers. Now, since the milk of the two farmers is mixed in the tank, a sample is taken from each farmer's milk before pumping it into the tanker, and the samples are examined if necessary. One day, the yogurt production process failed due to the presence of antibiotics in the milk. It is undisputed, and this is important, it is undisputed that the source of the antibiotics could only be the milk of one of the two farmers. So the milk samples of the two farmers were to be examined. In the direct evidence condition, the vignette went on to say that the sample of the other farmer's milk was lost in the laboratory Hence, it was only possible to examine the defendant's sample. This examination revealed antibiotics in the defendant's milk. 
the reliability of the laboratory testing is known to be 85%. So based on these results, the dairy claimed that the farmer should pay the agreed sum. In the inference condition, only the defendant's sample was lost, and when the other farmer's sample was tested, no antibiotics was found in it. Again, the reliability of the test was 85%. So the inference here is straightforward. Actually, it is inevitable. And still we found that subjects were much more willing to accept the claim in the direct evidence condition than in the inference condition. And the result was highly statistically significant. So while there were also differences in the subjective probability assessments, even when we controlled for those differences, there was still a significant difference in the willingness to impose liability. So it's clear that people prefer the direct evidence versus the inferential or the circumstantial evidence. As a whole, what were the lessons that you took from this first set of experiments? What were your conclusions? What characterizes our vignettes is that none of the previous explanations or justifications hold true for them. So we found a reluctance to rely on circumstantial evidence, even when the objective and subjective probabilities were similar even when the direct and circumstantial evidence were both equally concrete and none was merely statistical, when both were of the same type, such as eyewitness testimonies, this is another vignette that I haven't described, when they were both technological or both scientific and so on. So all the other explanations cannot account for this deep-seated heuristic or intuition that is something inappropriate to impose liability based on circumstantial evidence that many people share. Now let's turn to your latest article. What were your goals here? Why was this a follow-up to your first study? Okay, so in the new set of experiments, we had uh, three primary goals. First, we sought to examine whether there is an anti-inference bias only when judicial fact-finders are imposing liability, that is losses, or also when they confer benefits. And in many uh, legal and non-legal contexts, we know that people treat losses differently than gains. So this was the first goal. The second one was we wanted to know whether the bias would be more pronounced when the expected sanctions for the same behavior are harsher. Finally, we wanted to examine how easy it might be to counteract the bias, which is, of course, an important policy question. Let's take that first goal. What did you find in your latest study about the anti-inference bias with regard to benefits as opposed to losses? We found a relatively large and highly statistically significant anti-inference bias in the domain of losses and considerably smaller and only marginally statistically significant bias in the domain of gains. We replicated these results in a within-subject design, that is, when each participant saw all four versions, that is, the loss direct evidence, loss circumstantial evidence, gain direct, and gain circumstantial. And the very distinction between gains and losses and the replication of those results in a within-subject design probably mean that people consciously believe that direct and circumstantial evidence should be treated differently. It is not an unconscious bias, and it is not merely an epistemic bias. It is also probably normative. So let me broaden the discussion. Obviously, as academics, we're puzzled and fascinated by this anti-inference bias and the general preference against circumstantial evidence, which we might feel even that the distinction is unfounded. But what are the practical implications here? Why should the legal system, as a policy matter, care about the existence of this anti-inference bias? Well, while it is important that judicial decisions would cohere with prevailing epistemological and normative intuitions, it is at least as important that courts would treat similar cases similarly. Whenever there is no rational basis for differentiating between two types of evidence, and often there is no such basis when it comes to direct versus circumstantial evidence, as demonstrated in our experiments, the the resulting distinction is irrational, and irrational decisions are unjust and inefficient. In as much as the laboratory findings capture the realities of judicial fact-finding, the anti-inference bias is therefore quite troubling. Are there ways to combat the anti-inference bias? Normally, when we talk about these kinds of psychological limitations, we talk about debiasing jurors. Can we debias jurors by recasting losses as gains, or can we inform juries that the bias is at work so that they can fight against it? 
as I mentioned before, we actually ran an experiment in the latter article in which we tried to de-bias the anti-inference bias, and without getting into detail, our attempts largely failed. In general, studies of jury instructions have shown that such instructions are not very effective in overcoming psychological heuristics and biases. As for reframing of the decision as entailing gains rather than losses, this is also rather tricky. First, this suggestion seems relevant only for civil disputes, where it might be possible to draw fact finders' attention to either the gains or the losses aspect of the decision. In criminal cases, the defendant is always about to lose something. But even in civil cases, this reframing is a two-edged sword. As it is possible to frame a dispute as involving either gains or losses, we can expect a framing battle between the attorneys. And the idea that uh, the party who wins this battle would win the case is not very appealing. Kind of interesting. There's actually a lawyering aspect to all of this as well as the systemic aspects that you're looking for. Right. Let's talk a little bit more. So if debiasing doesn't work, what are the other options for the legal system then? Well, in the two articles, we discuss three other options. One is to lay down evidentiary presumptions. Legal presumptions obviate the need for inference drawing by the fact finders as the law itself draws the necessary inferences. Take, for example, a rule according to which a person who possesses a certain amount of drugs is presumed to be a drug dealer unless he or she can provide compelling alternative explanations. Under such rule, fact finders do not have to draw the inference themselves. Hence, the anti-inference bias is largely neutralized. Second, the legislature may change the substantive rules, for example, by criminalizing preparatory behaviors such as carrying guns. Again, such criminalization obviates the need for inferences. Finally, law enforcement authorities and others may take steps ex ante to make sure that they have direct rather than merely inferential evidence. For example, CCT systems, a closed circuit television systems, provide evidence that people considered as direct rather than inferential. Final question for you, Ayal. Where else is there work to be done in this space? What are the issues that you and your co-authors would like to explore next with regard to circumstantial evidence? Well, the two studies we discussed today are part of two larger and, in my mind, fascinating developments in legal scholarship. So take the, the issue even more broadly than you uh, alluded to. So one is the emergence of behavioral studies taking into account of psychological insights, and the other is the emergence of empirical and experimental legal studies. And I think there are few legal spheres, if any, that can benefit from these two developments as judicial decision-making and evidence law. Much is already known about the interactions between human psychology and judicial fact-finding, but much, much more is yet to be explored. Well, Yal, thanks for coming on Excited Utterance and sharing your new research on circumstantial evidence and the anti-inference bias. I think you've opened up some tough questions about how we should handle circumstantial evidence in the legal system, and I certainly look forward to reading your future work in this area, whether it be behavioral psychology or the empirical evidence literature. Thank you very much. It, It was a great pleasure. To me, at least, the problem of circumstantial evidence has always held a particular intellectual appeal. As Ayal mentioned, in common parlance, a case being circumstantial suggests that it is weak and unproven. Yet, modern scientific methods, many of which are potentially more reliable than the noble eyewitness, are often circumstantial and involve inference. So with the anti-inference bias floating around, our gut preferences for direct evidence may be leaving potential improvements in accuracy on the table. The results of Eyal's two papers on circumstantial evidence are both illuminating and disheartening. Illuminating because he and his co-authors carefully isolated the anti-inference bias by excluding a host of possible confounders, and yet still found that they had a significant effect. Disheartening because their attempts at debiasing largely fail. As seen in a variety of other contexts, just because a decision maker is aware of a cognitive bias doesn't necessarily mean that the decision maker can correct for it. And just because we establish that people weigh direct and circumstantial evidence differently, 
or for that matter, benefits and losses differently, doesn't actually tell us which of the two valuations is the correct one. Such information is no doubt highly useful from an advocacy standpoint, but far less so for those of us interested in doing legal system design. The alternative tack taken by Eyal and his co-authors, namely avoidance, is one worth considering, both in this context and in others. Maybe the trick is to avoid inquiries that naturally pit direct evidence against circumstantial evidence altogether. Careful design of the substantive legal rules can perhaps make the problem then go away. Or a different mode of attack would be to produce direct evidence in copious quantities. When Ayal mentioned closed-circuit TV, in other words, surveillance cameras, I immediately thought of our earlier podcast with Mary Fan talking about police body cameras and how they would affect long-standing concerns about the reliability of eyewitness reports. That does it for this week's episode of Excited Utterance. Support for Excited Utterance was generously provided by Vanderbilt Law School's Grant Stetter Litigation and Dispute Resolution Program, as well as the Vanderbilt Institute for Digital Learning. The associate producer for this episode was Alex Nunn, and the production editor was Carson Smith. Music was provided by the Vanderbilt University Blair School of Music's Children's Cello Choir under the direction of Kirsten Castle Greer. I'm your host, Ed Chang, and I hope you'll join me again next week when we take on another new work in the world of evidence and proof. Thank you.